in some cases, long after 1784. There are two works that I want to talk about today. One is his remarkable dialogue, D'Alembert's Dream. The other is an even more remarkable dialogue called Rameau's Nephew. Now, D'Alembert's Dream is begun in 1769. It remains unpublished until 1830, although the work does seem to have enjoyed a certain amount of limited circulation in Baron Grimm's literary correspondence during the early 1780s. The literary correspondence, remember, was that newsletter that I talked about in a previous lecture on salons, a newsletter which allowed for a limited circulation of some of the materials that were appearing in French salons, a limited circulation to courts throughout Europe. The dialogue falls into three parts. In part one, we have a discussion between a materialist philosopher, Diderot himself, and a philosopher, D'Alembert, who still adheres to the Cartesian distinction that there's a fundamental dualism between mind and matter. In the second part of the dialogue, D'Alembert is asleep. He has a dream. During this dream, he's mulling over the implications of the discussion he's had with Diderot in the first part of the dialogue. And he recounts his dream to the Salonaire. Well, he doesn't recount it. He's asleep. His dream is overheard by the Salonaire Julie de Lepinas, the uh, woman to whom he's devoted. And she is concerned about what's happening to him and talking with his doctor, who happens to have stopped by, uh, Dr. Boudou, who is one of the leading medical researchers of the time, a man who, among other things, is responsible for being the first person to use the term tissues, or one of the first people to use the term tissues in the modern sense of the word. And so these three, these two waking people are trying to make sense of the ravings of a philosopher who is asleep and having a rather hard night of it. In the third part of the dialogue, there are further discussions between Julie and the doctor. D'Alembert is now awake and is left to attend to other business. And these discussions center on the moral implications of what's been discussed in the second part of the dialogue. As the Diderot scholar Walter Rex has noted, D'Alembert's dream is unique among Diderot's dialogues in that here is a dialogue that presents a consistent and uncontradicted position, a thoroughgoing materialist conception of the universe. And this is a position which is quite in keeping with arguments that Diderot had advanced in certain of his other works. It's a position that involves a rejection of a Cartesian distinction between material objects. These are objects like tables and chairs, which are extended in space, and what Descartes called thinking things, things which are not extended in space, a distinction, in other words, between mind and body. This position is presented. Uh, it's not contradicted, really. In other Diderot dialogues, as we'll see uh, later in this lecture, Diderot has a play between one position and another. Here what we have is a, a dialogue in which we have one position, this thoroughgoing materialism, but it's being articulated by three different people. And as it turns out in the second part of the dialogue, one of these people is sound asleep. Now the position that is being articulated here has some rather important theological and moral implications. The universe that Diderot seems to be constructing here, being a universe which consists simply of matter, is going to have no place for God in it. Or if there is a God at all in this universe, he's going to be, as Dr. Boudou suggests, a material God, uh, part of the universe and subject to its process a god who might grow old and eventually die. The morality that results from this conception of nature is going to be thoroughly utilitarian. It gives pride of place to things which are useful and has rather little use for traditional views of virtue that preach a doctrine of self-denial. At the time that he's writing this work, he's studying the works of the ancient Greek philosopher Lucretius, one of whose most important works, De Rerum Natura, had been translated by a member of the circle around Baron Dolbach, a, an important Enlightenment figure, also one of the most important public atheists during the 18th century. And Diderot had reviewed this work prior to publication. His account of nature also owed something to John Toland's pantheism. Uh, Diderot knew Toland's work because Dolbach had also translated some of this and had it published in 1768. 
And finally, he was familiar with the works of Dolbach himself, the famous atheist and materialist whose salon was a regular meeting place for members, for the philosophes, for those around the encyclopedia. The style in which the dialogue is cast is, however, completely unique. It's like nothing anyone but Diderot could have written. In the central section, we have this absolutely ingenious device of having Diderot's position enunciated by a man who's sound asleep and having it written down and reported by a woman with whom he's closely attached and then having her scribblings and her attempts to interpret this y interpreted yet again by a third person, the good Dr. Bourdieu. The result is an overlapping of voices in which Bourdieu sometimes is completing Julie's sentences and at certain moments the dreaming d'Alembert seems to be contributing it as well. But all of them are laboring in an effort to articulate a position which is basically Diderot's. Julie occupies the center of the dialogue in some sense. It's, it's she who is responsible for conveying the words of the dreaming d'Alembert to Dr. Bourdieu. It's she who leads the dialogue into different territory at a crucial point. Her contribution here must have been very like her contribution in the Salon that we talked about in an earlier lecture. She's somewhat demure. She admits that she doesn't understand everything that's being said. And what she does here is enable men to speak. She's bringing out notions from Diderot. She's pulling them out of d'Alembert. She's explaining d'Alembert to the doctor. And she's carrying on at certain points, working on certain further implications of what the doctor is saying. The dialogue starts almost as if we're walking into a discussion that's been going on for a while. It starts abruptly. There are no preliminaries. D'Alembert begins by listing some of the problems he sees with the Cartesian distinction between mind and matter. Now, D'Alembert, as I've mentioned, was a um, convinced Cartesian. He believed that there was a distinction between mind and body, as we talked about in the previous lecture. He thought this was one of the things that we knew through direct sensory experience, that we are both body and mind. He got this notion from Descartes, uh, the great French philosopher. Descartes had discovered the notion of mind, or the notion, as he called it, of thinking, thinking things, when he began to engage in systematic doubt. Uh, questioning whether he questions whether anything at all exists and comes to the conclusion that there is one thing I know exists, and that is me, that I'm thinking, that I am, I am something which thinks, and I continue to exist for as long as I am thinking. From this, Descartes moves to the idea that in the world we have two very different sorts of things. We have some things that are extended in space, and we have some things which are not extended in space, these thinking things which has all the features, and these things have all the features that D'Alembert sketches in his opening comments. He says, quote, It's a being that is said to exist somewhere, but occupies no single point in space. A being that has no extension, that exists in its entirety in every separate part of the universe, that is essentially different from matter, yet is, yet is one with it, that moves matter and follows the movements of matter, yet does not move, that acts upon matter, but at the same time suffers all its vicissitudes. And he seems to be troubled by this notion. It's, it's, a, it's a hard notion to grasp, and he has some problems with it. But he finds it much preferable to the alternative, the alternative that there's no distinction between mind and uh, body, that there's no distinction between thinking things and extended things, because to abandon the notion that thought, that something which thinks is separate from the rest of the world, forces him into a more, uh, into a position w which would be even more inconceivable. Namely, that we'd have to force ourselves to admit, as he puts it, that stones can think. In other words, that matter is capable of thought. Now to this, in the dialogue, Diderot has a simple enough response. He says, of course stones can think, and let me show you how. You grind them up, you mix them with some humus, uh, some compost. You use this composted mixture of stone and humus to grow plants. The plants are then eaten by humans, and they think. We might express what Diderot's trying to say here in another way, and that's to say that simply matter, namely the brain, 
organized in a sufficiently complex way, is capable of thinking. Descartes' thinking matter may differ from other sorts of things in the universe in its complexity, but it shares the trait of being extended in space with it. We don't need to think that there's a different sort of matter in order to have a matter that thinks. We just need to think that this extended matter is organized in a certain rather complex way. Diderot's way of saying this takes the form of an idea that all matter, everything in the universe, is what he calls latent consciousness. To release the consciousness that exists in matter, all that's necessary to do is to rearrange it in sufficiently complex ways. In the case of stones, the way you do this is by making them capable of being eaten by humans. As a final example of how to get matter to think, he suggests to his dialogue partner D'Alembert to think about D'Alembert himself and how he was created and how he as a child came into the world and then gradually, uh, after a number of years, began to think. And uh, the formulation here he gives, that Diderot gives here, is simply eat, digest, distill in a closed vessel, and you have the whole art of making a man. Now behind this vision is a notion that nature has really incredible capacities for reorganizing itself in a number of different ways, and it can produce a myriad of results. Diderot's nature does not remain fixed. Everything is in flux. As the dialogue between Diderot and D'Alembert in this first part goes on, we're taken into a world where not only can matter think, but Diderot speculates there are species of animals which are mutating over time. Earthworms, he says, are on the way to becoming larger creatures, just as massive larger creatures are on their way to becoming earthworms. He goes even further and he says, well, look, let's imagine that we could take a clavichord, an 18th century keyboard instrument, and if we could organize clavichords in ways that they could have sensation and memory, well, maybe we could invent a clavichord that would play itself. And if we could get clavichords that were sufficiently complex to be able to go out and get themselves dinner and reproduce themselves, we could imagine a world in which clavichords got together, went out to dinner, came back home, and produced little baby clavichords. Now, the notion of, of reproducing clavichords may seem quite fantastic, but perhaps all Diderot may be suggesting here are certain things that, in at least our time, we see people working with in the areas of artificial intelligence. Why not have computers that could program themselves, computers that could make new computers? So perhaps here Diderot, with a rather wry and ironic tone, is nevertheless looking ahead toward certain developments that would take other centuries to be able to achieve. This fantastic universe is the consequence of Diderot's refusal to maintain a firm boundary between mind and matter. Once that dogma is lifted, almost anything becomes possible. The first part of the dialogue ends uh, with Diderot saying that the conversation he's had with D'Alembert is going to continue to haunt him, and indeed it does, because D'Alembert goes to sleep, and during D'Alembert's sleep, even stranger versions of the doctrines that Diderot has been talking about come into D'Alembert's mind, and he begins talking in his sleep, and Julie starts trying to write these down and make sense of what he might be saying and talks to the good doctor about this. There are a lot of topics going on here, and I think for our purposes we can talk about three of them. First of all, there are certain theological implications. Secondly, there's a question about how individuals are organized, um, how an individual person relates to their organs, to their bodily composition. And thirdly, there's the problem of individual identity, how individuals have a sense that they are indeed one person. First, to the theological implications. Julie questions whether the speculations that are, that are pouring out of D'Alembert are worth discussing, since she seems to suggest, as she suggests to the Dr. Bordeaux, none of these ideas seem to have any type of practical utility. Bordeaux responds that, yes, they do have an important bearing on at least one issue, the existence of God. One of the great virtues of the Cartesian distinction between mind and matter, this dualism, was that it preserved a place for God, uh, separate from creation, separate from matter, 
creating it and sustaining it. But in the system that the dreaming d'Alembert seems to be elaborating, the system that he's gotten from the waking Diderot, there's no role left that can be played by God unless he becomes something like the pantheist God, which is to say that God simply becomes a term that you use to denote everything that exists. The main topic of discussion here isn't how things stand with God, but rather with human beings. And first of all, this involves the question of how they hold together, and secondly, how they have a consciousness of their own personal identity. The question of how we're supposed to think about the relationship between individuals and the world in which they exist is elaborated in two rather striking images. One is the image of a bee swarm, a swarm of bees that is gathered together and looks like almost a single object, and the other is the image of the spider. The image of the bee swarm comes from the dreaming d'Alembert, who's trying to think about the way in which the world is organized, or rather, as he puts it, the general supply of matter in the universe. And he, trying to work through in his sleep the implications of what Diderot has been telling him, thinks that maybe matter is like bees swarming from a beehive. They group together to form entities, the bees do, which when you see them, when an external observer looks at them, they look like they are a single object. But if you poke a stick at them, which I wouldn't recommend, the bees will swarm, they'll disperse, and eventually they'll recombine in some other form. This is the image that um, D'Alembert in his dreams seems to be using to talk about individuals. We are a collection of organs, like the bees, and we are held together by laws of continuity and by, a, as he puts it, a general bond of sympathy. Sometimes our various organs will go off on their separate ways. After all, uh, we have a man here, D'Alembert, who's sleeping, but he's talking. He's active in some sense, but passive in other sense. We seem to have a division between him. But it's Julie who provides what's perhaps the most striking image, and an image which pushes the discussion even further, and that is the image of a spider in its web. And this relationship between the spider and the web serves as an image for the mind and its nervous system. Like the spider, we are aware of events that have an impact on our web. With increasing distance from our web, events have less of an impact on us. Yet, nevertheless, we are tied into all of nature and thus influenced in differing degrees by it. Well, if we're tied into nature, if we're like a spider sitting in a web and all the vicissitudes of the web, anything that impacts on the web impacts upon us, how do we nevertheless know that we're different from the web? How do we have a sense that we are separate from the rest of nature? How do we get this idea of personal identity? Uh, the spider example helps us somewhat here. This is a system which does have a center, the spider, although it's a rather fragile center. Pressure on certain parts of the brain, for instance, can cause a loss of consciousness. And there are some experiences uh, that can't be localized in any one part of the network. Julie seems to be thinking about sexual pleasures here. For her, they're not connected with one part of her body. They permeate her entire body. But we're still left with the question about how I can be the same person if all of my cells die and are eventually replaced by others, other cells. And the solution here seems to lie in the notion of memory as a type of connection, which, like the bees, represents a swarming together of distinct entities. But again, we shouldn't fool ourselves about how fragile this unity is. It's possible that different organs will have different interests. It's possible that there can be a fragmentation of desires. And indeed, in the dialogue I want to talk about in a minute, Rameau's nephew, we have a dialogue, a rather long dialogue, with a person, the nephew of the great composer Rameau, whose personal identity is much more fragile and much more tentative than other people's. And indeed, this is a man who has great problems holding himself together. The immediate upshot for this dialogue, though, is that with this revised notion of what a person is, we seem to need to rethink what morality involves. Much that was once thought of as a matter of individual responsibility now seems to be attributable to heredity, and as a result, many of the ways in which we understand virtues and vices, the implication seems to be, need to be rethought. And that implication is the main task of the final part of the dialogue, 
Now, the major locus of discussion in the final part of the dialogue involves questions about morality and questions, indeed, rather particularly about sexual morality. And the question is whether any of the sorts of restrictive rules that, uh, that are traditionally part of morality between the sexes, whether these can stand when they're examined in the light of the question of whether they promote pleasure or whether they're useful. The doctor is at his most insistent here. Julie seems to be a little bit uh, shocked by what he's telling her. Masturbation, or as it's called in the dialogue, private pleasures, may not be terribly useful, but in the doctor's view, it is pleasant. This makes it preferable to chastity, to corrupting a friend's wife, or to risking one's health and reputation. As for other sorts of couplings, and in a few pages, the dialogue runs through various sorts of possibilities, Dr. Berdu argues, quote, it makes no difference which sex does what, with which, and to whom. And on that rather compromising note, the dialogue comes to its conclusion. Materialism thus yields here a rather straightforward moral philosophy that says, maximize pleasure and utility. That's not Diderot's last word on the subject, though. His last word on the subject is a remarkable dialogue, Rameau's nephew, and I want to talk about that next. The only thing that prevents us from saying that D'Alembert's dream is the most audacious dialogue that Diderot would ever write, or perhaps anyone would ever write, is the fact that Diderot winds up trumping this with an even more brilliant and audacious dialogue. And the name of that dialogue is Rameau's nephew. He began working on it as early as 1761. He revised it over the next 15 years. It doesn't seem to have circulated at all during his lifetime, and it doesn't appear in print until 21 years after Diderot's death. It's first published in 1805, and it appears in a German translation by the great poet Goethe, uh, the first of many later admirers that the work is going to have. The French manuscript from which Goethe worked subsequently disappeared, and it's not until 1891 that a copy of the work in Diderot's own handwriting would be found, and it's found in a collection of erotic literature that's owned by a French nobleman, and this literature is bound together in a volume that carries the deliberately misleading title, Tragedies and Diverse Works. The final resting place of the manuscript is singularly appropriate for one of the things that Diderot is doing in the dialogue is providing a vivid portrait of the world in which those poor devils who inhabit the underworld of the Enlightenment live. The work is a dialogue between two figures. One of them, a philosopher, is simply designated as me, moi. The other is simply designated as him, lui. The him here is Jean-Francois Rameau. Jean-Francois Rameau uh, was an actual figure. He really existed, although when Goethe translated the dialogue, he thought he was completely imaginary, but he was a man. There was, actually was a person like this. He was the nephew of the great French composer Jean-Philippe Rameau, and he seems to have been one of those somewhat pathetic figures who, coming to Paris in search of his fortune, finds that life in the gutter is rather mean and nasty, and that even those who have wits to ingratiate themselves with others who are in a position maybe to give them dinner, even these people can find themselves tossed out on the street when their luck turns sour. And as the dialogue starts, we're learning that the nephew of Rameau has been tossed out of a, a nobleman's house and his uh, hard times have come to the poor nephew. Much of the remarkable energy of this dialogue stems from the character of its principal protagonist, who is described on the opening page as, quote, one of the oddest characters in this country where God has not stinted us. God has not stinted us with odd characters, in other words. He is quite mad. He is thoroughly insane. He is forever prone to wandering off on tangents. And as a result, this is a dialogue that simply explodes in a number of different directions. You, you, it's difficult to figure out where this thing is going at any moment. He's also a rather despicable fellow. He's a social parasite. He's been hanging around with a group that includes many of the major opponents of the philosophes in Paris. He's been doing a lot of their dirty work for them. And he has terrible morals. He cares only about himself and only about filling his belly. 
all that matters for Rameau is Rameau. But as the philosopher comes to realize, he's also a genius in his own way. He's quite gifted musically. He's also a master of pantomimes. And one of the unique features of this dialogue, and remember, dialogues, of course, are usually exchanges of words between individuals. One of the unique features of this dialogue is that it regularly collapses into long segments when Rameau is imitating things and people, imitating the things and people that he's been talking about. The most memorable of these pantomimes include a lengthy imitation of opera arias in which he performs arias from every opera that's popular in Paris at the time. And perhaps the most memorable is a closing pantomime in which Rameau shows how every member of society takes advantage of everyone else in society in order to survive. And finally, the philosopher recognizes that Rameau is a genius last but not least because he provides a, he proves to be a remarkably sharp-sighted observer of customs and morality. He has a keen insight into how society works. And while he's a despicable person, he's not a hypocrite. He doesn't disguise the fact that he's despicable. He's honest, at least. Thus, in Rameau, the philosopher has more than met his match. And Diderot here has set the stage for what is really one of the greatest philosophical confrontations of the Enlightenment. Because while the good philosoph cannot accept the morality that Rameau is espousing, he can't reject it out of hand. What makes this cynical view of a world in which everyone seeks to gain as much advantage as they can over everyone else, what makes this vision so troubling is that, in the end, maybe this is just a somewhat more brutal version of the moral philosophy that Dr. Bordeaux was articulating at the end of D'Alembert's dream. The very things that make Rameau's nephew so brilliant make it utterly impossible to summarize. The two protagonists wander through the streets of Paris. Their conversation sprawls over a host of issues. The discussion ends without a clear victor and leaves readers to wrestle with the question of what Diderot is trying to tell us in the dialogue. And this is perhaps why this is a dialogue which has been read so many different ways by so many different commentators. The dialogue may have begun simply as an attempt by Diderot to respond to the attacks of opponents on the encyclopedia by associating the opponents of the encyclopedia with this madman Rameau. But by the time he finished with it, it had become something much more complex. Rameau is arguing for positions that Diderot can't reject, and by the end of the dialogue, the philosopher is forced to embrace positions that could hardly have been endorsed by Diderot himself. Some commentators have suggested that perhaps in this dialogue, Diderot may have been confronting some of his darkest fears. If we see Rameau as a legitimate, if somewhat disturbing, if very disturbing indeed, offspring of the Enlightenment, then the dialogue really becomes, in a sense, a struggle of the Enlightenment with itself. Though the dialogue between him and me may end without a clear victor, the dialogue itself, I think, is an impressive testimony to Diderot's loyalty to at least one of the fundamental convictions of the Enlightenment. For what's going on here is an exercise in criticism that's so courageous and so uncompromising that it doesn't hesitate in calling even the principles of the Enlightenment before the tribunal of reason. Well, so much for Rameau. In the next lecture, what I want to do is look at the encounters that the Europe has with exotic peoples, the voyages of exploration that bring back news of people who have rather different customs, rather different mores than Europeans do. And also in the course of that lecture, we can look at one final dialogue by Diderot, his supplement to Bougainville's voyage. After listening to lecture nine, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. How was Diderot's library preserved for us? Let's listen to the professor's response. Yes, yeah, so Diderot's library winds up in St. Petersburg thanks to Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia. At a certain point in Diderot's life, he's hitting hard times. He has a daughter to whom he's devoted. He wants to get her married. In order to get married, you need to have a dowry. 
Diderot doesn't have a lot of money, so he decides with some reluctance that what he has to do is sell his library. Word gets around that he is selling the library. Um, an offer to purchase the library comes from Catherine the Great of Russia with a number of stipulations. First of all, she pays him more money for the library than he's asking. She gives him much more money than he's expecting. Secondly, she stipulates that uh, she doesn't want to take possession of the library until after his death, so he gets to keep the library and use it. Um, this is a period when you don't have public libraries, so the possession of a library or access to someone else's library is very important for a philosopher. And thirdly, she puts as one of her provisions that because she wants to make sure that someone is going to take care of the library and there have been certain expenses in its collection, she pays Diderot a, a regular stipend for his efforts. So Diderot gets much more than he bargained for and um, gets to keep his library, gets paid for maintaining it. But then after his death, the manuscripts do go off to St. Petersburg. And indeed, um, that's where we think the manuscript of Rameau's nephew must have come from. It was probably brought from St. Petersburg down to Jena, which is where Goethe got a hold of it. This ends Lecture 9. The Enlightenment, Lecture 10. New Worlds, Strange Peoples, and Peculiar Customs. We've been spending the last couple of lectures looking very closely at one thinker, uh, Denis Diderot, and talking about his impact on the Enlightenment. And what I want to do in this lecture is move out quite a bit from that limited focus and talk about the encounters of Europeans with uh, other peoples in other parts of the world and how these encounters influence some of the thinking back in Europe about society, about culture, and about morality. So this will be a lecture on new worlds, savage peoples, and the peculiar customs that they happen to have. But before we're over, we'll be back to talking about one last dialogue by Diderot, his supplement to Bougainville's voyage. Now there's one issue that, that looms behind much of what I'm going to be talking about today, and that's a charge that's frequently made about the Enlightenment. And the charge is that the Enlightenment engages in what might be called a uh, false universalization, or that there's a problem with Enlightenment universalism, in quotes. And, and this charge seems to come in two forms. First of all, sometimes it's argued that the Enlightenment is inconsistent in its applications of certain universal judgments. For instance, it'll say that all men are rational. But in fact, when we look at what counts as men, uh, women may not count as men, and hence there's an assumption here that women are not fully rational. And at least in certain quarters, there may be assumptions that people of color are not fully rational. Sometimes it's also argued that the Enlightenment's commitment to universality blinds it to particularity, that it defines rationality in ways, for instance, that might be specific to Europeans, thus ignoring the possibility that peoples in other cultures may be rational, just as rational as we are, but rational in different ways. If the problem with Enlightenment universalism is that first problem, a problem of it being an inconsistent application of otherwise unproblematic moral judgments, then all you need to do is extend the Enlightenment. All you need to do is bring other groups into the Enlightenment. So when you say that all men are rational, you have to recognize that women are as rational as men. If, however, the second criticism is at all persuasive, then we may have more problems because the very notion of reason that the Enlightenment is operating with, the very notion of rationality, this may be itself a rather limited and constricted conception. And perhaps it's worth keeping this distinction in the back of your minds as we work through this lecture, and indeed as we go on to certain other points later on in this course. So what I'd like to do here is really four things. First of all, I'd like to begin by discussing one of the more influential forbidden bestsellers, as we might call it, of the 18th century, a book called The History of the Two Indies. Then I want to talk more generally about this obsession that the 18th century had with exotic lands and peoples. Thirdly, I'd like to discuss some of the implications that Rousseau drew from this literature on foreign lands and peoples in his Discourse on the Origins of Inequality. And then, last of all, we'll talk about that final dialogue of Diderot's Bougainville's Voyage. <laughs> 
Now, one of the most widely read 18th century books bears a rather forbidding title. The title is Philosophical and Political History of the Settlements and Trade of Europeans in the Two Indies, the Two Indies being the East Indies and the West Indies. It was published in 1770. It went through 17 editions and something on the order of 25,000 copies. The author was listed as an abbe, a clergy, someone who was trained for the uh, priesthood but didn't actually have a position, didn't have a parish, uh, named Reynal. He lives from uh, 1713 to 1796. He's a frequent visitor to Enlightenment salons. He's also regularly employed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the French government as a writer. And on first glance, the history of the two Indies is the sort of book you'd expect to come from a man who's basically a minor league philosophe who's been working for the government. There's a wealth of information here about the geography of the New World and of the Pacific, about French commercial relations with the West and the East Indies. There's information here about the spread of trade and commerce and also comments about the beliefs and customs of non-Europeans. But along the way, one also finds striking condemnations of slavery, attacks on colonialism, polemics that are aimed at demonstrating that the so-called savages who populate the New World are in fact happier and more virtuous than Europeans, and also discussions of religious beliefs of these peoples that raise rather troubling questions about the rationality of Christianity. The explanation for this peculiar feature of the book lies in the fact that Reynal had a silent collaborator, Diderot. The two men had interests that meshed rather nicely. Renal had connections with the nobility. These connections with the nobility protected him. He could write just about anything he wanted to write within reason. Diderot, on the other hand, was a man who was filled with ideas, but he knew from past experience that it would be dangerous to publish them. So there's a marriage of convenience here. Renal has his name on the cover. Uh, Diderot gets his ideas at certain crucial parts of the book. The introduction to the 1783 edition makes it very clear that something more is going on here than simply a collection of stories about exotic peoples and useful facts about commerce. There's a long passage here, which I want to read. In dealing with the subjects that are important for human happiness, your first concern and duty must be to rid yourself of all hope and fear. There, lifted up above all human considerations, you float above the atmosphere and look down at the earth beneath you. You shed tears for persecuted genius, for forgotten talent, for rewarded virtue. You pour insult and shame on those who deceive and oppress men. You see the arrogant head of the tyrant brought low and covered with mud, while the modest brow of the just man reaches up to the top of the sky. There I can truly cry out, I am free and feel myself equal to my subject. There, finally, as I see at my feet, these beautiful lands where the arts and sciences are flourishing, which lay for so long under the darkness of barbarism, I'm wondering, who is it who dug these canals, drained these plains, founded these towns, brought together, clothed, and civilized these peoples? And the voices of all enlightened men among them have answered, it is commerce, it is commerce. Now, this is really a strange passage. It captures very much what happens when we have 18th century thinkers, uh, 18th century European thinkers trying to think about other people, um, namely that they keep coming back to themselves. The introduction begins with this great image of the narrator distancing himself from all human concerns, lifting himself up above the world and taking a godlike view. And uh, indeed, the narrator is sitting in judgment over the actions of mankind, throwing tyrants down into the mud, championing the, uh, the downtrodden, and so forth. But then the focus shifts to the lands where the arts and sciences have flourished. And here, the question that runs through much of the history of the two Indies first arises. What is it that has made these countries flourish? What is it that has brought about this transformation, this revival of, of, of learning? What is it that's, that's made these lands happier? And the answer we meet is, it's commerce. Thus, the shortened title of the book, and this is a book which we know simply as the history of the two Indies misses something, it's not just the history of the two Indies. 
It's a history of the commercial and political relationship, as the full title indicates, between Europe and the two Indies. It's a record of the impact that a discovery of new worlds has had on the development of Europe. And let me say something now about the impact of that encounter and how Europe developed what could only be described as an obsession with things that were exotic. The book that Reynal and Diderot produced is part of a much broader genre of travel literature. This is a literature which is devoured by Europeans during the 18th century. This is something that they just can't get enough of. For some time, there had been considerable interest in the indigenous peoples and the wildlife of North America. There was a long-standing topic of debate here about whether the animals in North America were, as the great French naturalist Buffon had argued, whether these were inferior versions of European animals, whether you'd seen degeneracy take place in the New World where animals and species got smaller and smaller. This was an argument that was opposed, that met with opposition from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And there was also an important contribution defending the virtues of American wildlife that came from the pen of a young Virginia naturalist. His name was Thomas Jefferson. There was also a burgeoning literature on indigenous peoples in North America that had attempted to construct theories of uh, development, stage theories, uh, theories of social evolution. Most famous of this, uh, these would be the notion of there being four stages through which all civilizations move. Societies begin as hunters and gatherers. They then move on to pastoral societies of shepherds who follow flocks around. Eventually, they develop into agriculturally based societies where land is, is owned and um, tilled and developed. And finally, they become commercial societies based on trade. Now, these four stage models, and this model of four stages, was a way of organizing the diversity of peoples that Europeans encountered because it allowed you to make the conjecture that when you ran into some of these indigenous peoples in the New World, well, they were living lives that were very different than Europeans, but the argument could be made they were simply at a lower level of social evolution. Their societies were organized around modes of subsistence that had once predominated in Europe, but which had now been passed, that we now evolved beyond that. And so you could have works, like the very influential work by uh, um, a Jesuit named Jean Lafitteau, who travels in the New World, a work that's published in 1724 and entitled The Customs of the American Savages. And what he argues is that when you look at the American savages, the American savages are basically living a life which is very much like the life that is described in the ancient Greek epics. So if you look at uh, North American indigenous peoples, they are living the same life that Homer described. What was new, the new information in the 18th century came at least in part, as a result of a fruitless exploration. And this fruitless exploration was the search for the great southern continent, the, uh, the unknown southern continent, the Terra Australis Incognita. And this was a continent which was supposed to be located in the Pacific Ocean. Now, prior to the 18th century, Europeans knew next to nothing about the Pacific. And in the 16th century, the great geographers, such as uh, Mercator and Ortelius, they'd argued that there was so much land in the northern hemisphere that it had to be balanced by an equal amount of land in the southern hemisphere. The problem was that um, as exploration proceeds in the southern hemisphere, they're not finding enough land. And by the time you get to the 18th century, the only place where you could find a land mass large enough to balance the land masses that are north of the equator, the only place that you could find that land mass would have to be somewhere in the Pacific, somewhere around, somewhere between New Zealand and South America. Possibly, you know, this might be in the South Atlantic, but, but the Pacific was really the target. Voyages in search of this great unknown continent, which you can, you can see conjectures on maps of what this unknown continent was supposed to look like or where it was supposed to be. Voyages in search of this unknown continent were made by Dutch explorers. They're made by Englishmen. And in the course of this exploration, they, they of course, don't find the uh, great unknown southern continent. It's not there to be found. But they do come across a, a previously unknown island, Tahiti. Uh, 
And this is discovered by the Englishmen Wallace and Carteret on a, on a joint expedition. They, Wallace splits off from it and discovers the island. And he recommends it as a possible site for astronomical uh, observation. And uh, shortly after Wallace leaves, a Frenchman, Louis-Antoine de Bougainville, who makes a voyage around the world in, uh, during this period, he comes upon this island as well in 1768. And finally, it's visited by the uh, truly remarkable British seaman James Cook, who made three voyages across the Pacific, mapping probably m more of the world than any man before his time. And it's the, it's the voyages of Bougainville and, and Cook that really caused the greatest stir in Europe. Bougainville had a really interesting career. He lived a rather long life. Uh, he was born in 1729, died in 1811, and his subsequent career involved service in the French Navy during the American Revolution, which would have put him on the American side, as well as eventual political positions that he occupied under Napoleon. He wrote a widely read account of, the circumnav of his circumnavigation of the globe in 1771, and of particular interest to Europeans was his account of Tahiti, which, as he described it, was a paradise. This, this was heaven on earth. It was a land of natural beauty, natural abundance, and also, rather importantly for him, of strikingly relaxed attitudes towards sexual mores. Indeed, he named the island of Tahiti after the Greek island uh, Kathia, which was supposed to be where the goddess Aphrodite lived. So Tahiti on his map is the new Kathira. Cook's voyages had an equally profound impact and produced a rather impressive body of scientific literature. His voyage had been bankrolled by the Royal Society. Among other things, they wanted to get him to Tahiti so he could observe the transit of Venus across the sun in 1769. This is a rare astronomical event, which is important because if you watch Venus make its way across the sun from a number of different widely dispersed points on Earth, it becomes possible to get some sort of sense of, of what the distance of the Earth to the sun is going to be. You can make certain calculations. But you need to have observation points that are widely, uh, widely spread apart, and Tahiti looks like a promising observation point. On the voyages of the Endeavour, his ship, between 1768 and 1771, Cook traveled with uh, a British naturalist named Joseph Banks. He was a wealthy fellow of the Royal Society. At this point, he's uh, a rather young man, aged 25. Banks provides a detailed record of the plants and animals that he encounters in the region. And on subsequent voyages uh, with his ship, the Resolution, Banks is replaced at the very last minute by the German naturalist Johann Reinhold Forster and his young son, uh, Johann Georg Adam Forster. And the latter publishes a two-volume account in English entitled A Voyage Around the World that um, this is published in, in 1770. And like the history of the two Indies, this is a work that merges descriptions of native peoples with criticisms of European politics. The, young, the younger Forrester would go on to become one of the most radical of the German supporters of the French Revolution. And these accounts by voyages by Cook, by Bougainville, um, Forrester's account, these are things which are, which are avidly read by Europeans. Examples of the plants and wildlife that they brought back from these voyages fascinated those who came to see them in the newly opened museums of this period. The British Museum, for instance, established in 1753. Later, after the French Revolution, the Louvre is going to include um, material from these voyages in 1793. And you also have a tradition here among European nobility of putting together what are called Kunstkammern, or, or cabinet of curiosities. And these are a staple of 18th century court and city life, where you bring together uh, various curiosities from a part of the world, uh, from from different parts of the world, and also of a great deal of curiosity are natives. In the wake of Cook's voyages, there's an intense interest in bringing back skeletons of natives, and indeed instructions were given to an Australian expedition on how to visit native burial sites, and explorers were also advised to visit scenes of battles in hopes of uh, finding bodies uh, whose heads might be brought back and preserved so that we can study these native peoples. Finally, there were a few living natives who were brought back to Europe, including a man from Tahiti named Omai, 
who returned with Cook's crew. He was presented to the king and queen. He had his portrait painted by the great British painter Reynolds. He went to the theater. He wound up collecting botanical specimens with Banks, and he attended a total of 10 meetings of the Royal Society during his time in England. And indeed, it, th this gets so crazy that there's even a German duke who is so taken with the notion of bringing back peoples from other worlds that he constructs an oriental village uh, complete with gardens and pagodas and hopes that he's going to be able to get Chinese to come and settle here and live for him, uh, live there in, in this village. Uh, when none can be found, he decides that instead he's going to settle it with a group of Africans, most of whom later died, uh, one of them, at least one of them by suicide. This alone should be enough to suggest that there's a rather sinister side to this exploration, a sinister side that has to do with racism and slavery. But what I'd like to focus on for the rest of this lecture is the way in which this explosion of travel literature, this encounters with, with new peoples, uh, this encounter with, with peoples with different customs, how this influenced the way in which Europeans began to think about themselves. Now, there's one point in the history of the two Indies where Diderot reflects on how important it is to preserve records of how what he called savage men lived. And he thinks it's important to preserve that because, he, because there's a danger, he feels, that future generations may assume that all of this was simply mythology, that these people never existed. He felt that it was because we'd had encounters with primitive peoples, with savage peoples, it's because of that encounter that we've been able to make progress in the moral sciences. As he puts it, up to now, moralists have looked for the origin and foundation of society in the societies which they had before their eyes. People attributed crimes to men in order to give him gods who atoned for them. They plunged him into blindness in order to become his guides and master, and they called mysterious, supernatural, and heavenly that which is only the product of time, ignorance, weakness, and deceit. But since it has been perceived that social institutions did not derive either from the needs of nature or from the dogmas of religion, because countless numbers of people lived in a state of independence and with no, with no religion, the vices of morality and legislation have been seen to arise with the establishment of societies. In other words, what, what Diderot is saying here, what people were beginning to find in America and in the Pacific was a more natural way of living, a more natural form of society than the version that, that could be found in Europe. And this, these people, these savage peoples, these primitive peoples might serve as a standing critique of European corruption. We can see this in two different individuals by looking at Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Second Discourse, his Discourse on the Origins of Inequality, and then by turning to Diderot's The Last Dialogue of Diderot that I want to talk about in this course, the supplement to Bougainville's Voyage. Rousseau's Discourse on the Origins of Inequality was his submission to a prize contest that was held by the Academy of Dijon. I've mentioned this in an earlier lecture. It was a contest which solicited papers. It asked people to explain what the origins of inequality were and whether they were authorized by natural law. From looking at the question, you can guess what sort of answer the Academy might have been looking for. There are certain distinctions between individuals that are not simply the product of law, allegedly, but are supposed to be authorized by the law of nature. Presumably, they're looking for an argument that says that these distinctions might be legitimately recognized by legislation while other distinctions might not be legitimate. Rousseau's answer was uncompromising in its radicality, and perhaps for that reason, it didn't win the prize. He argued that whatever distinctions there might have been in the state of nature between individuals were trivial and insignificant. They matter. They take on importance only when people leave the state of nature, only when people leave the natural condition, and move into more civilized arrangements. Hence, it's the process of civilization which at every step along the way amplifies inequality, creates distinctions, and in general creates new miseries for the human race. 
The second discourse makes considerable use of travelers' reports and writings in natural history. Indeed, as the great French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss once suggested, this may very well be one of the founding documents of ethnography. Relentlessly, Rousseau marshals the sort of data that his fellow philosophers drew upon to make a point that contradicted what many of them had assumed. Namely, where they saw human beings as naturally social, naturally sociable, Rousseau argues, somewhat perversely, that nature had intended that individuals should not be social, that individuals were meant to remain alone, and as a result, life in society produces really uncounted burdens. This was what readers like Diderot, and certainly Voltaire, as well as certain of the Scottish moral philosophers that I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, this is something that they couldn't accept. For them, man's sociability was his defining feature. And this perhaps is one of the reasons why speculations about the origins of languages during this period were of such importance, since if we possess a language, since we possess a language, uh, this would seem to give an indication that human beings are naturally sociable. Yet at the same time, there's a great deal in Rousseau's account that certainly Diderot could accept, most notably the discussion of property. Rousseau's essential point was that the creation of private property brought with it countless miseries. It divided the earth, it set men against one another, it corrupted politics by allowing the rich to dominate the poor. This was an extreme position, and, and many in the Enlightenment would reject it. Uh, Voltaire, for instance, had, a, had many problems with this. But the notion that the march of civilization is not an unmitigated blessing, this was hardly something that was unique to Rousseau. In the history of the two Indies, Diderot himself had asked, who is happier, the civilized man or the savage man, and came to a conclusion that was remarkably similar to that of his former friend Rousseau. He writes, primitive man is serious and not sad. You rarely see stamped on his brow the passions and disease which leave such ugly and damaging traces. He can neither lack what he does not desire nor desire what he does not know. The only evils from which primitive man suffers are natural evils. Diderot was willing to admit that civilized men might live longer, but he said their lives were much more miserable especially if they had to labor to support the others in society. Here he writes, Everywhere masters, everywhere humiliations. In our towns, the worker and the artisan who have no workplace must submit to the law of greedy and idle bosses who through the privilege of monopoly have bought from the government for nothing the power to make industry work and the right to sell its products at a very high price. In other words, as the 18th century came to a close, there were at least some philosophers who were willing to entertain the thought that civil society, an entity which in the entry on philosoph in the encyclopedia, uh, de Marseille, the author of that, says that, this, that civil society is the only god a philosoph really can worship. Well, there were some, as the century came to a close, who were beginning to wonder whether civil society was in fact a racket a racket through which the rich and powerful exploited everybody else. And the suggestion there would be that perhaps individuals would be happier in Tahiti. And this is the view that Diderot articulates in his supplement to Bougainville's Voyage. The supplement to Bougainville's Voyage is another one of those late works by Diderot that has a rather curious publishing history, and the Baron Grimm plays a role in this history as well. It was begun in 1772. Apparently, the idea was that Diderot was going to write a review of Bougainville's account of his voyages, and this was going to be circulated in Grimm's uh, literary correspondence. The work as a whole doesn't appear, though, until 1798, and it falls into two parts. It begins with a speech allegedly made by an elder Tahitian. This is a speech to Bougainville's men as they depart. And this speech is an uncompromising denunciation of European colonialism. The second part is an account of a conversation between a chaplain from Bougainville's ship and Uru, one of the Tahitians, and this is a critique of European sexual mores.
The critique of colonialism confronts what would be one of the most vexing problems that the philosophers faced. They praised natural men, yet they also praised trade and commerce. And the problem is that trade and commerce were everywhere corrupting, or, or at least altering in dramatic ways, primitive societies. It was pretty easy to criticize the first wave of European exploration if you were a philosopher. It was easy for philosophers to mock what the Spanish had done, because after all, the Spanish exploration of the New World could be seen, at least in their eyes, simply as a scheme to grab gold and get it back to Europe. But there was an account of property and the origins of property in John Locke's second treatise. Locke's account of the origins of property suggested that there might be other types of colonization, a type of colonization where individuals settled, uh, where they made unproductive land more productive, that this was in general a good thing, that it was the proper mission of men to subdue the earth, to master it, to make it fruitful. And when philosophers looked at the English settlements in North America, which in their view had rendered land more productive and allowed for greater wealth, well, this looked rather different than what the Spanish had done. So the question of how you thought about colonization, if you were a philosopher, involved making some rather difficult distinctions. In both the history of the two Indies and the supplement to Bougainville's voyage, Diderot pours contempt on the notion that Europeans could claim entire continents simply by landing on a shore and burying a piece of metal and then claiming that everything there exists. He instead uses the lesson that he learned from John Locke. If you want to own land, you have to work it. You have to mix your labor with it. You have to make it more productive. If the land is uninhabited, this presents little or no moral difficulties. But what do you do when you arrive, as most Europeans in fact arrived, at lands which already are occupied by a native population? Diderot argued that it might be permissible for two parties to work peacefully together provided that the Europeans were not encroaching on lands that the natives needed, and provided that the Europeans didn't do threatening things like build fortresses or construct armed encampments. What was absolutely forbidden was enslaving native populations. And here Diderot, as with other, many other of the philosophes, uh, was adamantly opposed to the institution of slavery. Men are brothers, he argues, and they shouldn't be turned into beasts of burden. You might have slightly stronger claims if you'd been washed up on an island, or worse still, if you'd been stranded on an island and then attacked by a native population. I mean, that might give you certain rights against a native population. He places great emphasis, however, in both the two Indies and in the supplement to Bougainville's voyage on what sorts of obligations followed when native populations abide by the basic rules of hospitality when native populations don't attack Europeans, which in fact seems to be the case in most of these explorations, Europeans are not attacked. This may explain why in the speech which he gives to the old man at the start of Bougainville's voyage, the old man stresses that the Tahitians have shown a great deal of hospitality to, towards Bougainville's men. In these cases, in the cases where you've landed on islands and people have shown you basic rules of hospitality, Europeans can make no further demands on the population. If they wish to settle there, they must abide by the rules that have been set down by the native populations. If they are unwilling to do that, they should simply leave and not come back, which is what the old man advises Bougainville and his men to do. In the second part of the supplement to Bougainville's voyage, Diderot turns to a much less difficult task. Indeed, one gets the sense that this is something that Diderot at this point could almost do in his sleep. Namely, he mocks priests and he praises sensual pleasures. The basic thrust of his argument is given away in, 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 in its subtitle. It's a dialogue on, quote, the undesirability of attaching moral values to certain physical acts which carry no such implications. The point here is that the chaplain from Bougainville's ship arrives and in the view of Uru, the uh, Tahitian, the chaplain seems to view sexuality in terms that Uru can only find unnatural, unhealthy, and generally perverse. The chaplain sees sexuality as a moral question. Uru sees sexuality as a question simply of maximizing pleasure. He sees it as part of hospitality. <laughs> 
After a brief struggle with his impulses, and Diderot is rather good at recounting what this struggle looks like, the chaplain comes to the conclusion that since he's in Tahiti, he ought to follow their customs. But even as Diderot tells this tale, he undermines it in interesting ways. In the first part of the dialogue, the dialogue where the old man is denouncing European colonialism, in this, in this part of the dialogue, there is a discussion between two people who are allegedly reading this unpublished supplement to Bougainville's voyage. And one of them notes to the other that there are many quote unquote European expressions in the old man's speech. And in fact, this may be Diderot's way of subtly pointing out that in fact, the construction of the old man's speech isn't really a Tahitian speech. This is a Frenchman's speech, Diderot's speech, about why colonialism is wrong. Much the same could be said about the natural morality that Diderot implies that the Tahitians have. Oru's morality sounds like something that a radical deist or a Unitarian might have written. The argument here is that there are eternal laws of nature we should submit to these eternal laws since they ensure our happiness. The argument here seems to be that context is what matters. The morality of actions will be different in Paris than they will be in Tahiti. In each of these cases, nature demands that we calculate our utilities and decide what brings about the greatest happiness. And that calculus is going to work differently in Paris than it does in Tahiti. Now, when Europeans finally begin to actually study these so-called primitive peoples seriously, they discover that far from the sort of reasoning that you're presented with in Bougainville's voyage, these are populations which have well-developed prohibitions on certain sexual practices. They have elaborate kinship systems that are designed to make sure that they're not um, committing incest. All of this suggests that perhaps for all their talk about studying savage men, what Diderot and, and others were really doing were projecting certain European concerns back on a native population. By treating savages as natural men, they were missing an essential point. These, after all, were not peoples without civilization. They had rather elaborate sets of customs and mores, and though these customs and mores were different than ours, there's no sense in which these moralities are more natural than ours. It would take another century to get clear on this. But if the Enlightenment can't be credited with figuring all this out, at least its interest in other peoples and their customs opened up the possibility for later generations of discovering this fact. So here we've looked at voyages of discovery. In the next lecture, what I want to look at is to turn from France and look at the way in which this fascination with human nature had an important impact in an enlightenment in another area, and that'll be in Scotland with the Scottish moralists, David Hume, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson. After listening to lecture 10, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Hadn't Europeans since Columbus been aware of the existence of other peoples with other customs? Let's listen to the professor's response. That's true, and certainly the 18th century's encounter with savage peoples is not the first encounter with so-called savage peoples. We have travel literature during the uh, after you know in the wake of Columbus's voyages. We have moralists, for instance, like uh, like Montaigne, the great French writer Montaigne, who writes a, uh, an essay on cannibals where he compares the virtue of cannibals to the virtues of Europeans. The new world of the 18th century, it's, it's sometimes written, um, was the Pacific, though. And uh, what's unique here, perhaps, is this exploration of the Pacific world with the peoples that are encountered there. What also may be unique here is the attempt to try to construct, well, to try to reconcile two things. First of all, an assumption that human beings are everywhere the same, a notion that human nature, at least, is everywhere the same. And this is one commitment which many of these Enlightenment thinkers have, that human beings are basically the same. And the fact that they're finding all of these very different customs. So you need to construct theories that somehow can explain the variation that you find in human beings without giving up on the notion that all human nature is fundamentally the same. And in some sense, that's the great mission of the Scottish moralists that we'll talk about in the next lecture. This ends Lecture 10.
remember to visit this course's website at www.modernscholar.com, where you'll find additional information about the lectures that you just heard. If you borrowed this course from a public library and would like your own copy of the course guide for future reference, call Recorded Books at 1-800-636-3399. And we'll send you a free copy. A shipping charge will apply. The Enlightenment, Lecture 11. The Scottish Enlightenment and the Origins of Social Theory. We've been focusing on the French Enlightenment over the last several lectures, but it's worth remembering that the Enlightenment was an international movement, and during the 18th century, there was a remarkable flourishing of intellectual activity in Scottish universities, and that's going to be the topic of this lecture, the so-called Scottish Enlightenment. Now, the most famous people associated with this movement are probably the, uh, the philosopher David Hume and Adam Smith, who's well known as the author of The Wealth of Nations. Um, but the thinkers associated with this movement pursued a broad range of interests, and they had a particular concern with moral philosophy, which, as we'll see, is a discipline that, at this time, ranges across most of what would later become the concerns of politics, economics, and social theory. The story begins, though, not with these really famous people, but with a man named Francis Hutcheson. He's a Protestant from Ulster, and he's generally viewed as the founder of Scottish moral philosophy. But the provocation for at least some of Hutcheson's important early writings, that provocation is provided by yet another man, his name is Bernard Mandeville, and he's a descendant of Huguenot refugees who emigrate from Holland uh, to England after the Glorious Revolution. He becomes infamous for a little poem which he publishes in 1705 called The Grumbling Hive, or Knaves Made Honest, a poem which he reissues in ever-expanding editions in 1714, 1723, 1732, a book that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it's a two-volume book. The title of this book is The Fable of the Bees, or Private Vices, Public Benefits. Now, the poem that inspires all of this writing is an allegory, which suggests how a hive of bees a hive of bees that are vicious in every way, nevertheless prosper. The bees have a very successful hive until the unfortunate day when they decide that it's time to reform themselves morally. And when they do that, the hive becomes desolate. The message of the poem is clear enough, and if it wasn't, all of the pages of commentary that Mandeville added in subsequent editions made it clear. The things that moralists had typically classified as vices principally envy, greed, and pride, turn out, in Mandeville's view, to be the very things that make society prosper. The message of this, then, is that government shouldn't try to make their citizens moral. They should simply try to make sure that individuals and their property are reasonably secure and then let private vices work for the public benefit. To quote Mandeville's poem, So vice is beneficial found when it's by justice lopped and bound. Between 1724 and 1726, there's a 30-year-old man named Francis Hutcheson who publishes five letters criticizing Mandeville in various London and Dublin journals. He would return to criticize Mandeville in more ambitious works in the years that followed, and he wasn't alone. The Fable of the Bees was one of the most controversial books of the day. Indeed, someone, uh, one, of, one of the Mandeville's critics regularly spells Mandeville's name as man-devil. He's the devil man. He's evil. He's, he's, he's the bad guy. Hutchison's arguments, though, unlike those of these more conservative defenders of public morality, were unique in that they opened up some new directions for thinking about society and morality. And his criticisms revolve around two central points. First of all, he's critical of Mandeville's account of human nature. He thought that Mandeville had erred in elevating the principle of self-love, as it's called in this period, elevating this to a, to a position that contradicts the actual role that it plays in social life. Mandeville's bees are basically egoists. They only worry about their own happiness, and in the process, they wind up improving society. Hutchison argues that while this may be clever, 
Um, it's an overly rationalistic, and as a result, much too individualistic account of human action. In his view, human beings are not driven solely or even primarily by self-interest. We are sociable beings, and as such, our actions are driven by what Hutchison called um, sociable virtues. Chief among these is the notion of benevolence. We are, in short, naturally benevolent creatures, and an account like Mandeville's um, is basically blind to the non-rational elements that bind human beings together in society. It's our sentiments that make us social. When we reason, we may become individuals, but there's basically a set of social sentiments that unite us together in society. In that sense, the fable of the bees may be very clever, but in the end, um, it's unrealistic. It doesn't actually capture what human beings are like. His second criticism involves Mandeville's notion of virtue and vice. Hutchison charges here that Mandeville is curiously traditionalist. Um, for Mandeville, greed, avarice, and luxury are vices. I mean, he calls them vices even when they tend to promote the good of society. That's how he can get the great paradox, private vices, public virtues. Hutchison, in contrast, suggests that to call something a virtue was to say that it promoted the public good. And when Mandeville takes it for granted that self-interest, avarice, or greed are vicious, Basically, what Mandeville is doing is relying on a traditional and quite questionable definition of virtue and vice. For Hutchison, the forming of moral judgments involves reflections on how certain actions may benefit the public good, and to the extent that these actions promote the public good, we should simply call them virtues. They're not vicious. In other words, insofar as things bring about public benefits, insofar as avarice and greed turn out to produce public benefits, we should simply call them virtues. They're not vices. In 1729, Hutchison begins teaching moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. His lectures and his writings have an enormous influence on the development of philosophy in Scotland uh, for the rest of the 18th century. He came to be viewed both in his own time and in ours as the founder of a particular tradition in moral philosophy. At this point, it might be helpful just to list the name of some of the more prominent figures that we associate with what's called Scottish moral philosophy. We begin, of course, with Francis Hutcheson, the man who argues that benevolence is the foundation, basically, of all virtues. Um, perhaps the greatest philosopher associated with this school is David Hume. Um, he, at 28, produces what is one of the classics of modern philosophy, the treatise of human nature, which is an attempt to apply Newtonian reasoning to moral philosophy. It's a book that, as he puts it, falls dead born from the presses. It's not a popular success. So he devotes much of the rest of his life to reformulations and restatements of its central arguments, as well as producing a number of very important works in the area of epistemology, in the area of philosophy of religion. And he was also quite a good historian in his own time. Another figure associated with the school that I mentioned at the start of the lecture was Adam Smith. We know him as a political economist. We know him as the author of The Wealth of Nations. During his time um, in the 18th century, he was best known um, perhaps as the author of a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and I'll say more about that in a minute. I'll also talk about a man named Adam Ferguson, who taught at Edinburgh and was the author of a very influential book, especially influential on the continent, called An Essay on the History of Civil Society. Also associated with the school were other men, uh, Thomas Reed, a professor of moral philosophy who had an interest in philosophical psychology, a uh, professor of civil law at Glasgow named John Millar, uh, who was the author of a book called The Origin on the Distinction of Ranks. Uh, which is really one of the earliest books to try to undertake a systematic account of classes in society. And there were two jurists, um, Lord Cams and Lord Monbato, who had a great deal of interest in anthropology and in the anthropological origins of law. Now, it's difficult to characterize what unites all of these people together into a single school, but there are a few common points of agreement here. They all share a tendency towards a secularizing and socializing approach to moral questions. 
They've detached ethical issues from theological considerations. Uh, their focus in ethics is on the life of individuals living in society, actively engaged in social affairs. They also share a sensitivity to the diversity of human customs, mores, and social arrangements. They're very interested in travel literature. This is also driven, this, this diversity of customs is also driven home to them by the particular situation in which they live. The Scottish lowlands are economically developed, commercial and cosmopolitan. The Scottish highlands are economically backward uh, with more uh, primitive forms of social organization still prevailing there. So just looking out your back door in some sense gives you this contrast that you can also find in the travel literature. They share a faith that through the application of a scientific approach, you can bring order to this chaos. And in this sense, they are following Newton. Newton is their great inspiration. Newton had showed, as I said in an earlier lecture, how apparently disparate events, falling bodies on Earth, celestial movement in the heavens, how these are all governed by the same law. The hope among the Scottish moralists is that they can find an analog to gravity, an analog that will show how the laws of attraction and movement work in societies. And at least some of them think that this can be located in the sentiments of mankind, sentiments such as sympathy and benevolence. And this brings us to the final point that unites them all. They share an awareness of the weakness of reason as a force capable of uniting men into society. Um, David Hume, after all, famously writes, Reason is and ought to be a slave to the passions. Reason can't provide us with experiences, nor can it provide us with desires. It can't explain moral judgments. What it can do, however, is to look at how our sentiments work, to analyze how our sentiments work, and perhaps come up with certain corrections to the way in which our sentiments work. And we can see that in Adam Smith's great book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Now, one of the most sophisticated reconsiderations of Hutchison's moral philosophy comes from the pen of a man whose uh, economic theory is what makes him famous, um, Adam Smith. The book is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It is uh, published in 1759. It makes Smith's reputation. It's worth, re it's worth also noting that this is a book which Smith continues to revise throughout his life. Um, it appears in expanded editions um, almost to up until the time of his death. It's a book that attempts to try to make sense of the principles by which we judge, by the way in which we make moral distinctions, um, by the way in which we naturally make moral distinctions. And it, in that sense, is an attempt to create what we might call a natural history of morals. We want to look, he wants to look at the rules that we in fact follow, the principles that human beings would use to evaluate um, in the absence of any type of corruption of their moral reasoning. We're looking at what healthy moral reason would look like. There's a certain order in which, the, in which Smith thinks that this um, process of moral evaluation is acquired. He suggests that um, we first evaluate our neighbors, afterwards we evaluate ourselves. In other words, we learn to do morality by judging others, and then somehow we internalize these judgments, but we move from evaluating others to evaluating ourselves. For Smith, the origins of morality are to be sought in the way in which the judgment, our judgments of others are carried out, and the the test here becomes whether we can carry out a process that he calls sympathetic identification. By sympathy, what Smith means is, he defines this as our fellow feeling with any passion whatever. And it means a basic human capacity to enter into others' situations, to identify with um, a friend's joy, with a friend's grief, um, with a friend's fears. And Smith's argument is that this human capacity for sympathy, our ability to understand what another person is feeling, this is inherently pleasurable. We enjoy doing this. We enjoy doing this even when someone is suffering a terrible loss. Um, our basic solidarity that we feel with others who are going through experiences of grief is, Smith argues, not unpleasant, even though the experience itself may be. And this, he says, may explain the pleasure that we take in watching tragedies on the stage, 
What speaks to us in all these cases is a basic human solidarity that we can understand one another. As Smith understands it, moral approval is our ability to sympathize with an individual and with his or her situation. Disapproval comes about when we can't do it. Um, why couldn't we do it? Well, there may be cases where an individual's reactions uh, may be excessive or they may be insufficient, and this prevent, prevents us from sympathizing with them. For instance, if someone receives news of a death of a loved one and they ha this has no impact on them at all, they're absolutely cold-hearted, they, they seem to respond to, uh, not at all to this event, uh, it would be very difficult for us to enter into uh, sympathizing with them. We couldn't really comprehend their actions. By the same token, someone who um, reacts excessively to a rather trivial event, uh, who goes uh, in, into great expressions of sorrow over a trivial loss, um, these are people that we might look at them and um, be unable to understand what has set them off, and hence uh, we morally disapprove of this action. The achievement of moral approval thus, in a sense, can be a game in which two sides are playing here. We attempt to sympathize with the other, and the other attempts to present to us a conduct with which we can sympathize, and this can be reversed as well. It's reversed as well because we come to learn how we can evaluate our own actions by internalizing these sorts of skills that we've developed at evaluating others. And we learn to look at ourselves as others would look at it. And we can do this because we're members of society. When we enter into society, we, we acquire what Smith describes as a mirror um, in which we compare the objects of our passions uh, with the passions that they engender with the actions that accompany these passions, and we then ask ourselves whether this is appropriate. We need to distance ourselves from ourselves because, and again, this is an argument that goes to a bedrock notion of what human beings are like, because he says our sympathy is inherently partial. And in that sense, it works like gravity. It's, it's strongest when we think of ourselves, when we think of our friends and our family, but it becomes ever weaker as we move further and further away from the circuit, uh, from the circle of our intimate friends and acquaintances. He offers a really dramatic thought experiment as a way of illustrating what's going on here. It's an example uh, that involves what would happen to a European when a European learns that there's been an earthquake that's taken place in far off China. Let me read the example. It's a bit long, but it's absolutely brilliant. Let us suppose, he writes, that the great empire of China, with all its myriads of inhabitants, was suddenly swallowed up by an earthquake, and let us consider how a man of humanity in Europe, who had no sort of connection with that part of the world, would be affected upon receiving intelligence of this dreadful calamity. He would, I imagine, first of all, express very strongly his sorrow for the misfortune of that unhappy people. He would make many melancholy reflections upon the precariousness of human life, the vanity of all the labors of man, which would thus be annihilated in a moment. He would too, perhaps, if he was a man of speculation, enter into many reasonings concerning the effect that this disaster might produce upon the commerce of Europe and the trade and business of the world in general. And when all this fine philosophy was over, when all these humane sentiments had once been fairly expressed, he would pursue his business or his pleasure, take his repose or his diversion with the same ease and tranquility as if no such accident had happened. The most frivolous disaster which would befall himself would occasion a much more real disturbance. If he was to lose his little finger tomorrow, he would not sleep tonight. But provided he never saw them, he will snore with the most profound security over the ruin of a hundred millions of his brethren, and the destruction of that immense multitude seems plainly an object less interesting to him than this paltry misfortune of his own. Let's stop for a minute here and see what Smith's saying. Um, what he's saying, basically, is that this is natural. This is how we're wired. This is how we can't help but think. We are partial in our sentiments. Um, we may learn of great disasters in other parts of the world, um, but these disasters, while we may speculate about them, while we may say things about them, while we may engage in what Smith calls fine philosophy, these disasters can't have an impact on us that's going to be as great as things that happen closer. The loss of my little finger, 
knowing that, as Smith puts it, knowing that tomorrow I will lose my little finger, that will disturb me much more in my sleep tonight than the loss of the entire population of China, this vast myriad numbers of people in this earthquake. But Smith goes on. He doesn't let it stop there. And let's read the next part of this. To prevent, therefore, this paltry misfortune to himself, would a man of humanity be willing to sacrifice the lives of a hundred millions of his brethren, provided he had never seen them? In other words, to prevent the loss of your fingers, Smith is saying.